A lot of people ask me, how did you come up with this idea? And it's an interesting question because <laughs> I'll try to explain it as best I can. When I was a kid, I, our family didn't have a lot of extra money and we had everything we needed. We had food on the table, we had a roof over our heads and we had a great life, but we couldn't just go pick out any toy we wanted at the store and have our dad buy it for us. But if there was something else we needed, we kind of had to create it. And so I remember taking like an old Tonka truck that was a cement mixer. You guys, have, if you're old enough, you might have seen these, but I needed a flatbed truck to haul my little tractor around on, and I didn't have one. And so I, I had to tear the cement mixer off that chassis, off that little Tonka truck, and, and I made myself a little bed out of the, out of the piece of plywood and, and screwed it onto there. And so it was like, life was like that. You know, if I needed an implement for that toy tractor, I had to make it out of some tin, with some tin snips and a piece of tin and a board and some nails and some baling wire. Dave's always liked to play in the dirt. He was always, as a kid, he liked to be in the sandbox, playing with his toys. We'd go outside and do things. I mean, if there, we'd play a lot. We'd play in the dirt. We'd play with our toy tractors in the dirt. And if we wanted to make a potato patch, we had to make something to make furrows with or whatever it was. And he was always wanted to be with dad. Uh, dad did, was a postmaster in Enterprise, but he did a lot of custom work for farmers around the area. And Dave always enjoyed being with dad on a tractor, on a combine, whatever he could be, even though he, suffered uh, allergies, uh, hay fever and so forth. He, he just loved uh, ag and being involved with that in ag. And that translated over to his later life where he got to play in bigger sandboxes. All that kind of stuff honestly played into just learning how to be creative, being innovative and figuring out a way to do something without somebody always telling you what you could or couldn't do. One thing about Dave is he always tried to improve things. New fertilizers, new techniques, uh, croppage, whatever that might be, and even uh, one-pass implements, uh, modifying implements on the farm to be more efficient. And, and so his creativity came through in his ideas and, and how to make those ideas into something that was workable. And, uh, so if you went to Brent Hunter's farm, you found pieces of equipment that you might not have found anywhere else because David had his hand on them and couldn't leave anything as it was from the factory. You had to figure a way to, to make it better and more efficient. We were always doing crazy different things and coming up with ways of, of uh, making some apparatus to fulfill some need that we had here. And it was just a lot of fun. We, we, we had lots of different things that we messed around with. Some of them worked and some of them didn't. You know, me and Brent, we did all kinds of crazy things around this farm. We took, we took um, stuff that people had never tried to do before. For a couple of years, we decided we were gonna try using what's called soft rock phosphate which was kind of like talcum powder, only it was black. And it's this black powder that's mined directly out of the ground up in Idaho. And, uh, and it's like coal dust almost, except even finer. And we tried to put it on and it was just it blew away in the wind. So we, picked, we fixed up a slurry system where we put it in water and then we uh, hooked up big sprayers, nozzles on the sprayer, and we sprayed it on the field. So we made this big old tank with some, it was like a 4,000 gallon fuel tank that we cut the top out of. We 
put some circulation tubes. We, we found this old pump that would pump like a thousand gallons a minute to circulate this stuff in there and mix it all up and keep it in a slurry. It was real hard to keep in suspension. But it did, it did do quite a bit of good to the, the farm, but it got so hard. We looked like a bunch of coal miners when we got through working with it because it was just really black and, uh, and really hard stuff to work with. We were completely just covered with that stuff. And it was, and then for them to let us take a bath in the house and wash that off, you know, I mean, it was pretty much, you go outside and take your shower out on the lawn first because you're not coming in here. So we eventually got away from it, but I think it did the soil some good. <laughs> Well, actually, that field right over there was the first place that I went and picked up that first box of dry hay to take it into the kitchen to see if I could make steam do something with it. I was over here loading hay one day, and Dave told me about uh, cooking hay on his wife's stove with steam in it and how soft it made it. Dave's always been a curious, curious person. He told me he was thinking about it one day and went and got some hay and put it over a steaming pot and it softened the hay immediately. He, he brought a, a concept that came from a, a pressure cooker and a box of hay that originated from a tortilla steamer in a taco shop. I don't know, I think I was so interested in him pursuing this because it sounded like to me something that was like this is an amazing idea. And if brought to fruition, could be changing for, for the whole agricultural industry. I was raised in a family where we, where, where faith in God was really emphasized and trusting Him and realizing that He knows a lot more than we do and so that's always been a part of my life and, and I was taught young to pray and to do it every day. And whenever you need, whenever you need help or need to express something, uh, gratitude or whatever. Particularly in 1994 when we had that really tough year of just never getting natural dew for a long, long time. The night that I was praying for some help on this particular issue, more specifically, I just, I needed to learn to ask a specific question, I guess, a little bit more in order to get a more specific answer instead of just help me do this or whatever. It was like, what, what is there out there? What could we do to resolve this problem? And then that thought sprang into my mind of seeing the girls at taco time put those tortillas in the little steamer oven. And that was just, that was just like a light bulb went on. I went and did some investigation with some of our, the local companies here in town. that had some steam cleaning equipment. I looked at just mobile steam cleaners, something that I thought I could put on top of a hay baler and um, shoot some steam into the, into the baler while we were baling. But everywhere I looked, all the stuff that I looked at, it was just hot water. And hot water by itself just doesn't work. It, it, I knew it had to be steam because that's what I had pulled off that pressure cooker. And, you know, honestly, during that summer, there was a lot of time that went by that I didn't really get a lot else done other than just looking at some of those things. I went to the library, where it was, which was the only place you could do research back then, pulled out the encyclopedia about boilers and, and learned that boilers are really complicated big things in power plants really from that. But it was, a, so it was a little bit intimidating uh, to think what in the world could we do to put a boiler on a trailer, in a field, behind a, a tractor, in front of a hay baler, bouncing along um, to, to try to do this job. Actually that fall, I kind of got busy with groundwork and all the other farming that had to be done and it kind of went by the wayside to some degree and that Christmas my family got together like usual. I think it was around Christmas time that year and, uh, and uh, I just asked him, I says, Dave, uh, 
So what have you been, what have you done with that idea about steam? And he kind of, well, I haven't really done anything with it. And he got on me and he said, you need to do something about this. You've got an idea there that you really need to try to develop and see what you can get done. I don't know, he claims that that was a little bit of uh, impetus for him to, to get back on that track. I'm not sure if his wife really appreciated me bringing that back up because it led to a few years of some kind of tight budgets and some stressful uh, situations through the early development of this story. And right after Christmas vacation and stuff, uh, the first of the year, um, I, I dove right back into it. And that's when I really started to search and see if I could find a boiler company that would support this type of an idea running around in a hay field with a boiler on a, on a trailer. I'm, I'm glad that if I had a part in, in bringing that about, then I'm, I'm glad to have played that role. And I contacted several different ones and everyone I contacted, they would send me information in the mail that I would look through. And, and I remember just pouring through lots of things, big envelopes that would come in the mail with their information. And, uh, every, and when I contacted them back after I made a selection of what I thought they had that might work, told them what I wanted to do with it, they all said, absolutely not. You are not putting one of our boilers in a hay field like this, bouncing around behind, behind a tractor. And so constantly, one after the other, after the other, they all just said no. And I got a little bit discouraged and uh, I had a little office down in the basement of my house in an old kitchen we had down there. And I was down there one morning early, just working along, kind of trying to figure out what I was gonna do. I just thought, well, I can just get on my knees and I'm gonna just ask and see what, see what happens. So I was actually praying and, and I just said, Heavenly Father, you know, you're, you gave me the idea of using steam to do something with hay, but I really can't find a company that will s supply a, bo a boiler for this kind of a thing that, to bounce around in a hay field. And I, I've exhausted all of my avenues that I know. And I was going on and on and all of a sudden the phone rings while I'm there on my knees. And I pick up the phone and it's a guy in Salt Lake at one of the companies that I'd talked to before. And he said, you know, Dave, just now a thought came to me and I think I know a company that would maybe support this idea and sell you a boiler to put in the field like this. And I said, well, that's, that's great. And, and anyway, it ended up being Kiwani Boiler back in Kiwani, Illinois. And when I contacted them, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you on this. And, we can work together, figure out what it is you need, what size of boiler you need, and we'll, we'll build it for you. And mind you, I'm not an engineer or anything, and so this was all kind of seat of the pants stuff, trying to put it together. I just took my pencil and used a little math from high school and tried to figure out how much steam we'd need and everything to produce to, to do the job that we felt like we needed to do to add the amount of moisture to the hay that was gonna be necessary. Dad worked on the farm, we worked on the farm. Uh, we all kind of had different jobs. My brothers and I, we were mostly the, the hand line movers, so we moved the sprinklers. That was our big part on the farm. My dad was the, he was the hay baler. He pretty much did all the hay baling and I did a lot of other jobs on the farm. I didn't do a whole lot of hay baling because that was dad's thing. He knew how to do it and he was the he was the mad scientist behind the steamer, so. I do remember my dad having a lot of sketch paper and the old engineering tools. He didn't have a computer or anything, but we had a desk in our house, and I do remember seeing a lot of his, his drafting tools that he would use and his paper that he would use to make his sketches and these designs of the, of the early steamers. I was probably about eight or 10 when dad started working on the steamer. I do remember um, my dad putting together the first prototype and it was kind of a, I remember it as this odd machine with these uh, <laughs> like probes that would go into the hay if I remember correctly. The idea that came to me at first was that we would have this boiler on a trailer with the water tank, the generator and the boiler and everything. We would hook the steamer up or the uh, baler up behind this little machine, but we had a little sidecar that would lift up and down over the windrow 
with some uh, little spikes that would just oscillate up and down through the windrow to put steam into the windrow all the way up and down through the, the profile of that windrow as we, as we were driving along to put the steam in ahead of the baler. I thought obviously that would be the best to soften it all up before the baler got there. It's hard to come up with memories from when you were eight or ten, but uh, again, I think I vaguely remember the first time we took the, the original steamer out to the field. I think it was the little field right next to the, the shop and Brent's house out there. And I remember going out to the field for the first time to try it out. And um, my family was there and Brent Hunter's family was there and um, they fired up this machine. We took it out to the field down here and uh, let down the little apparatus on the side to put the steam in the windrow and I had the boss, myself, uh, several other people around that day. Me and some of my siblings and some of the neighborhood kids and all the, you know, the people who kind of knew what, we were, what was going on chasing the steamer out through the field and it was going down the windrow. And of course it was pretty cumbersome at first. I mean we went through three or four deals that it, trying to get it to work. The first, the first machine was some kind of like a, a hay tether machine. It was kind of like a big old claw thing that was shooting steam out of there. We ran that thing down the windrow, putting steam in the windrow, and it looked really, really good. It softened the windrow up nice. So we went and got the hay baler, hooked it up behind there, went again into the field and headed down through the field. And man, I was just waiting for that perfect hay to come out the back of that baler. Oh, and then we'd come along with the baler. By then the steam was gone, so that didn't work. All of us kids were, were so excited saying, oh, the hay's so perfect. And then my dad's over there saying the hay's terrible. When it came out the back of the baler, it looked awful. It was still just dry and shattery and, and really uh, no better than it was if I had put no steam on it at all. And it did not do what they expected <laughs> this first round. You know, it was kind of a tough day to come home and tell my wife that all of this savings that we'd been saving for the years that I'd blown on this new machine, uh, it didn't work. So I had to kind of work through that with her a little bit. Finally, one day we were messing around with it and Brent Hunter, my, my boss that owned the farm, he just said, well, why don't you just take the hose off that, off that little sidecar and let's just get an extension and wire it into the front of the hay baler and uh, let's see what happens. So we just decided, or it became pretty obvious that we were gonna have to incorporate a machine that was attached right to the baler and make sure that the steam shot on the hay right as it went into the baler because especially if the weather was hot, the hotter the weather, the faster the steam dissipated. So, uh, so that's when the idea came along and we decided, listen, we're gonna have to do this. We're gonna have to put this thing together so that, the, so that it shoots the steam on the hay the very moment that it goes right into the baler. It uh, feeds these injection nozzles that pass underneath the pickup here. These are there to inject steam into the bottom of the windrow as it very first begins to be picked up by the baler, which will soften the hay to keep the leaf uh, lost at a minimum. I said, yeah, that, that's a good idea. Let's try it. So, so we did that, got it all hooked up, ready to go. We had this big steam hose coming right into the front of the hay baler, just baling wired up there so it'd hold. And I went out to the field out here to the west and, and uh, went out there by myself this time and went up one windrow. I didn't even want to hardly look back to see what was happening after what we'd been through already. But I got up to the top of the field and turned around and started back and looked over at those bales that I'd made and they looked pretty good from the tractor seat. And I thought, well, okay, I'll get out and take a look. So I jumped down and I walked over to that uh, couple of those bales and picked them up and you know what? They, they actually looked pretty darn good. And that, that was another big step in this whole process of development was learning that in order to make this work, we had to put the steam right in the hay baler. From there, uh, my dad did not give up, but developed further, which I probably didn't pay any attention to, I'm sure, until he had this big blue machine one day. 
The other early memory I have is, is my uncle Mike, my dad's brother Mike. Um, I remember him staying with us one summer. And I remember them working on these early steamers, these blue steamers underneath the hay barn. And as a little kid, I would go down underneath the hay barn and I'd hide behind the hay and spy on them and just watch what they were doing as they worked on those early steamers. And of course, there was a lot of refinement. I went to work that next week and figured out some hardware to get steam under the windrow as well as it was being picked up so we didn't lose a lot of leaves there and then over the windrow and back in the feed chamber of the baler. And, <clears throat> and I put that all on the baler, went out to the field, used it, and it, it honestly worked great. So when we got making this hay over here at Brent Hunter's farm, um, the hay buyer that we used most of the time at that time here was Nick Huntsman. And, and uh, he, was, he was really a proponent of this idea. He had seen and they had they had marketed some of the small bales that we made the first year in 1995 with the original prototype. Over the, the next few years, he built some prototypes. I remember uh, one of, right at the first, he had issues of getting the steam where he tried putting the steam on before the hay went into the baler and, and that didn't work. The steam dissipated and Brent and him worked on it and they were always tinkering with it. Uh, some days I would want to say, why don't you guys just stop and bale some hay instead of keep messing with it. That first edition, we used that for two or three years and, uh, and it worked really well. It was really pretty exciting to see that it would work and that we could bale hay when there wasn't any do and still have a good product. So it was really, uh, it really gave a vision of what the possibilities were. A lot of times before they got the steamers, they were just forced by weather conditions and stuff to either bell hay with a little too much moisture to beat a rainstorm or to to go out and bell it up dry to beat a rainstorm. And, and once they got working with the steamer and got it perfected, that kind of went away. We were starting to get a little attention with um, people hearing about it and some people would come and watch us work. A lot of people wondered what the heck we were doing when they saw us out in the field with this, with this other machine in front of a baler and steam boiling out. We, we almost had a few people call the fire department a time or two. They thought we were on fire. Yeah, it looked like a, it looked like we were pulling a train around. But it, yeah, it caused quite a bit of stir when people saw us out there doing that. And but of course they were interested. They were kind of excited to see if it worked too. So. Working with Brent Hunter was really, I have to say it was, sorry, it was one of the greatest blessings of my life. You know, to, to work for a man that, that was, uh, he's a man of faith for one thing and was really a good example, but he was also not afraid to try anything. And, and it was a place where we had a chance to raise our kids on this farm and make something out of them. Dave was here for a long time. I had great confidence in him, and so I was willing to, uh, to finance the development of this project, you know. So he'd, he'd build it, and I'd, I'd buy it, and we'd work with it. And, and then uh, as time went on, the next, the, 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 when he improved it, I'd buy that one and we'd work with that one. If it wasn't for him, uh, as really a key part of this, none, none of what we've done I don't think would have ever come about. For one thing, the circumstances wouldn't have been such that the need would have been recognized. And then just his, his attitude of, let's try something. You know, he was always like that. I don't think I'd have the farm if it weren't for Dave Staley being here with his, with his uh, insight and his understanding of farm machinery and the way they work. He's really been a great asset to us. He is, he is still so excited every time you talk to him about the changes that, that we've been able to bring to this agricultural world. Um, through the experimentation and, and everything that, that happened right here on this little piece of ground.
in this little corner of the world in Utah. My, of course, my, I didn't have as much foresight as Dave on what possibilities there were, but, but you're always, in this business, you're always trying to find something better. I mean, every year there's something new, some improvements, a different machine, a different method, a different fertilizer, a different uh, chemical, all of those things are continually changing in the agricultural business. It never stays the same. Uh, the way this thing has developed has been really, really a wonderful experience.